good morning. Uh, welcome to First Church of Christ in Grayson, Kentucky. My name is Ben James. I'm the pastor here. We are re-recording, so to speak, our message from Sunday morning. Even though this is happening on a day of the week, we had a, an interruption in our live stream service on Sunday morning, and we wanted to make sure that we redid this so that you could, if you're at home, if you were watching, uh, and we know that the time that the live stream stopped to the time that we were able to get it reconnected, there was a large portion of the message missing on Sunday morning. So instead of trying to piece it together and, uh, and miss a big chunk of the context of the passage, we just felt like it was the best just to re-record this and then post it uh, so that you could get the entirety of the message. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 24. Uh, we're going to be looking in this, the entirety of the chapter this morning. And as you're turning, we'll give, I'll give a little bit of a rundown basically as to where we have been up until this point. We are taking our summer, the three summer months, and we're in the book of Psalms. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to go through all 150 Psalms during this three-month period, but we are taking some of the major themes that we see in the book of Psalm and Psalms, and we are uh, going through those uh, to, uh, to kind of enrich us, to learn a little bit more, and see just how practical and how applicable that this Old Testament collection of writings, songs, prayers, poetry is in our lives. Now, the first week we looked at Psalm chapter 1, and we looked how uh, we're, we looked at one word, basically, and that's what we're doing. We're taking one word out of, these, um, out of these chapters and making kind of a theme out of it that themes the chapter. And the first one out of Psalm chapter 1 was planted or rooted, according to the translation that you are reading. And it was talking about how uh, the, the, the person who was rooted, who was planted in God's word and in his instruction in his law, that, that they, how blessed they were. Second week, we went to Psalm 2. In the same concept, we look at the word reign, God's reign over our lives and his authority when we submit our lives to him. And that used the same word, the blessedness, um, that we see from being rooted and planted in God's word in Psalm 1. It's the same concept of submitting to his reign in Psalm chapter 2. Now, in Psalm chapter 8, we skipped forward couple chapters, and we went to this psalm of David in Psalm 8 that declares him to be the name above all names. And we looked at that word above and what that meant in the Old Testament time as David was writing that. Then we went into the New Testament and we saw where this name that's above all names is the name of Jesus Christ. The next week we went to Psalm chapter 16, and we looked at the word preserve and how he is the one who preserves us, who sustains us, who provides for us. And again, the name of God begins to be mentioned in that, that Lord, you are my Lord, this Yahweh, this Adonai, this creator, this sustainer, this sovereign one. And we saw in the New Testament as we paralleled that, that that name is also Jesus Christ, the one who preserves us. Then we went to Psalm 23, and we talked about the word leads, uh, or being led, and how that is, when we follow God, we're, we're being led by the still waters. We're being led into green pastures, but also at the same time that there are issues and troubles in, in the valley of the shadow of death and forces of evil that work against us and being seated at a banquet table in the presence of our enemies. So today we're in Psalm 24, and we're going to be looking at the word glory. So hopefully you've had time to turn there. I have been standing here talking and have not gotten there myself, so I'm going to just continue a run-on sentence until I can get to Psalm 24, and there I am. All right, Psalm chapter 24, let's start with verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. 
Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Bow your heads with me and let's pray before we dive into this. God, thank you uh, for another opportunity to speak your word, to be able to uh, read your word and study it and learn from it. I ask that right now that for every person who is watching this, every person who is listening to this, whether it be the moment that we release it or years down the road, that God, your word is timeless and it does not return void. So I pray that for everyone watching, listening to this, that we would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive what it is that you have for us, whether it be comfort, whether it be conviction, whether it be challenge, whether it be um, just a, a combination of all of these things, God, I just pray that you would do the work in our hearts that you want done today. Father, I, as, as always, I pray for myself that, Lord, that you would remove me as much as possible from this message, that you would use me as your instrument. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through my voice, inspire me, and use my voice to communicate your word rightly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So to give you a little setting for this psalm, to, to give you a little bit of context, uh, this is a psalm of David. This is another one of King David's writings. And in the Old Testament, there was a nation that was called Israel. And these were God's chosen people. And he chose them to be a blessing to them and for them to bless all the other nations. And as we talked about last week in Psalm 23, that there's a continual cycle that goes on that God leads us into green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Those are cyclical and it's an ongoing thing. It's not just momentary green pasture, a singular event or still water. It is, it's cyclical, but at the same time, the Bible didn't mince words. We talked about that too, and that you will at the same time walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You will have evil come against you. We looked in, in the New Testament and Jesus' words, him talking about that he is the good shepherd, that when wolves come and try to attack, that he is the one that defends us. So Bible's not mincing words. It's not trying to paint a, a picture that's, that's not accurate in its um, reality of we will face tough things. And just like us today, facing tough things in our relationship with God, even through that, the same can be said with the nation of Israel, as they were God's chosen people to be blessed and to bless others as God's chosen, they found themselves in trying times. They found themselves in Egyptian bondage. And once they were delivered from that Egyptian slavery and bondage, they found themselves wandering in a wilderness, going to a promised land that should have really taken no more than three weeks, probably at the most, wound up taking them 40 years. And even when they get into the promised land, they, they still face enemies. They still face difficult times and trials. And, and we're going to talk about one of those here in just a moment. But during this time, this, the, the, the presence of God was to be with them. We see it in, in a little bit of a form. You see, because there, um, there was this, this cloud by day, this fire by night, and then the primary presence that we see while wandering through the wilderness and even into the promised land in the Old Testament where God's presence dwelt was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you're an Indiana Jones fan, then you, you probably have at least imagery of what the Ark of the Covenant looks like. It's a big box, gold, uh, has a lid on it, has two angels with their, their wings, two cherubim, that their wings, they're facing each other and they're pointing, pointed toward each, towards each other. And this is known as the mercy seat. And if you, uh, you know, if you want to get a description, you can look back into the Old Testament books of, of Moses in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, those types of things, and you get little bits and pieces of the Ark of the Covenant. But this is where God's spirit and his presence dwell. One of the 
things that happened to them, even after they got into the promised land. And, and again, this, this is a good thing for us to encourage us that you can be right directly in the middle of God's will, doing exactly what he wants to do, right in the place where he has set for you, that he's promised for you, and you'll still face difficult times. You'll still face difficult circumstances in this life. Know and be encouraged that just because you're facing difficult situations or, 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 or tribulations, that you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are automatically uh, rebelling against God or outside of his will. Just look to him for your source of comfort and your source of provision. But we see one incident in particular of where uh, this Ark of the Covenant was taken by one of the enemies of the nation of Israel, and that is the nation of Philistine. Um, so we, we see these Philistines. Um, they they kind of have this theme as an enemy of God, enemy of Israel throughout the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with that nation of Philistine, then you will know one of the Philistines themselves. I feel pretty confident whether you've been at church in your life or not. And maybe the most fom famous Philistine is the, the man named Goliath. And, and we all know, you know, the David and Goliath story, especially if you're a sports fan, you know, even if you've not been to church, you know this David versus Goliath metaphor that we look at this, this, this little this little thing going against this great big monster giant of a thing. And that's, that's this nation, that's the Philistines. Well, they take the Ark of the Covenant, they capture it and they take it back. And through a series of events, which you can read about in 1 Chronicles 15 and 16, and it's, it's actually that, that story has some humorous moments to it because the Philistines take it, uh, then they don't want it anymore because what's going on, so they ship it off to a couple different places, and the couple different places that have it, they don't want it, so they, they're finding different locations for it because of what's happening. But then we see that Israel um, gets the Ark of the Covenant. They, 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 they bring it back, and this is the setting for Psalm chapter 24 as they are bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into their possession. They're having this big parade. They're having this big celebration. There's music. There's dancing. There's, there's celebration. There's people lining the streets as this Ark of the Covenant is being brought back into its rightful place. And I think that that's just one of the um, one of the, a really awesome picture, if you'll, if you'll take a moment and just kind of picture that in your mind, that they're, they're carrying this Ark of the Covenant on two poles in between them, and they're, they're walking it back up the hill of the Lord because they, they kept it in the tabernacle, and it was kind of like a, uh, a mobile tent, basically, before the temple was built, that throughout the wilderness and even into the Promised Land, before the temple was constructed, this Ark rested in what was known as the tabernacle in a center room in there known as the Holy of Holies, and that's where God's presence dwelt. So they had been without the presence of God, and now they're bringing it back in, and they've got this celebration going, even David leading the procession of singing and dancing and just celebrating the fact that God's presence was returning back to its rightful place, and it was ascending the hill of God to return back to the tabernacle. So that's the setting for this psalm that we just read. And as we start to unpack this, as we start to look at a few of the verses a little bit more closely, I want you to remember that context. I want you to remember that setting. But then I also want you to keep three things in the forefront of your mind. In the front of your thoughts, I want you to be thinking about these three things as we go along. First, that God is the creator. Okay, God is the creator. Secondly, we were created for God's presence, but we were separated from his presence. So we're created for it, but there's a separation called sin in our lives. And then thirdly, only God can make a way. Okay? Only God can make a way to restore this type of separation. So let's look at the first verse, because right here, right out of the gates, David throws uh, some information and, and lays a foundation for the rest of this psalm that we really need to make sure that we get. He says that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So here's, here's what David's saying. Here's the concept. This is one of the most important distinctions in the Bible. And maybe even more importantly than it being a distinction in the Bible, it's one of the most important distinctions that we need to establish and, and have in our lives. And this is the fact that God is God 
and you're not. Now, I know that this is one of those things that we hear so often and sound so Sunday schoolish and so foundational that we can tend to even kind of roll our eyes when said preacher is talking about God is God and you are not. But David's laying this out that this, if we don't understand this, if we don't grasp this, if this is not something that we make part of our fabric in our relationship with Jesus Christ, then we really don't have a solid relationship. We're not built on a solid foundation in our relationship with Jesus Christ, that God is God and you are not. God is the creator. You are the created. And I know this is something that we feel like we need to just kind of gloss over and move on, uh, especially when we're reading, especially when you're hearing a lesson or a message of like, okay, we get it. We get it, preacher. We get it. Just move on, please. But let's pause for just a moment and let's really evaluate this. We may say that. We may hear that. We may even think that. But I want you to take just a few moments and I want you to honestly evaluate the decisions in your life and see if they're reflective of God being God in your life. Think about some of the places that you found yourself. Think about some of the things that's led up to that. If people were to look upon your decisions and look upon your life and what you say, what you do, how you act, how you respond, how you conduct yourself, does it, is it a reflection in your life that God is God and I'm not? Now, I'm going to be honest with you and transparent and tell you that in my life, that's not the case as much as what it needs to be. Because most of the time what I find myself doing is getting into this place of where I've made these decisions and instead of them, me seeking out God truly at first, understanding that he's the creator, I'm the created, he's God, I'm not. Instead of me seeking him out first for his plans, I tend to implement and make my own plans and then when things start going awry, when things start happening that I didn't necessarily plan to happen, then I kind of go to God as the safety net of God, help me. You see, what we're guilty of, and I'm guilty of, is that we make our own plans and then our prayer life usually consists of us, us begging God to bless our plans. When our prayer life needs to consist of seeking God, seeking His righteousness, seeking His plans, and then going into those, and we don't have to worry about them being blessed because God is the creator of the plan. God is the instigator of the decision that we've made. He's the determining factor in that. And we, all the time, all the time struggle with that. So understanding that God is God and we're not a big deal. So with that being said, with God being God, God being the creator, us being the created, we have to understand what is truly our purpose in life. We are created with every single fiber of our being. Our purpose as being the created of the creator is to bring worship, to bring honor, and to bring glory to God alone, period. That is our purpose. Now let me be even more clear with this. Your purpose in life is not to have a fat paycheck or a fat bank account. Your goal in life is to not have a beautiful family. Your purpose in life is not a self-actualization through some type of job or some form of relationship. Your primary goal in life and your primary purpose is not to have a social media perfect life that I'm the perfect husband, I'm the perfect wife, I'm the perfect parent, I'm the perfect sibling, I'm the perfect friend, I'm the perfect coworker, and the list go on and on. Those are not your purpose. Your sole purpose is to bring glory, honor, and worship to God alone. All of those things, everything else in life, flow from that being your primary purpose. And that's what Psalm 24 is saying to us. So then, David begins to ask a question in verse 3. And that question is, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? So we just, you know, one of the things that I wanted you to understand, and keep in the forefront of your thinking at the beginning, if you'll remember the second one, is that we're created to be in God's presence. We're created for his presence, but we're separated from it. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3. We see this separation, and it's a result of one thing from that point until the end of time, whenever mankind ceases to exist. The one central problem that's going to keep us separated is sin. 
That's what began it. That's what we suffer with now. That's what we'll go through till the end. So he's making this question, and he's saying, okay, to get there, who can ascend to this? Who can ascend this hill? Who's worthy of this? And he goes on, and he gives us some qualifiers. Because, honestly, the answer to that, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand on the holy place? It's God. It's God. That's the answer. So, basically, what I'm telling you is, yes, it's that exclusive, and yes, it is that simple. Only God can ascend on God's holy hill. Only God can be seated in God's rightful place. But then, to make sure that we're really understanding this concept, David begins to give us some qualifiers as to um, who this person is, some of, the, some of the traits, some of the characteristics that this, this person's going to have. First, he says that you have to have clean hands. Now, when the Bible talks about clean hands, it's not just talking about a ritualistic purification process. It is talking about that, but it's not limited to that. So the biblical sense of having clean hands is that you would never participate in injustice. You would never bring harm to anyone else. You would never spill someone else's blood, and you would never gain wealth through unjust means or hear me, that you would never harm another image bearer in any way, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, you would not bring another image bearer harm. And let me define what an image bearer is for you. If you look at a person right square in the eye, they're breathing, they're living, no matter if they're a creation of God, you are looking at an image bearer. And to have clean hands means that you, you don't participate in injustice. You don't get things by wrong means. You don't bring harm to anyone else. And harm is not just physical. Harm is emotional. Harm is spiritual. Harm is financial. Purposefully with bad motives. The second thing that they say is that you have to have a pure heart. Now what this means is that we have to be pure. We have to be righteous internally, not just externally. We don't just need to look the part or act the part or speak the part. We actually have to have righteousness, his righteousness inside. There has to be a purity internally, not only externally. That's who can ascend the hill of the Lord. So you've got to have clean hands and pure hearts. But the list doesn't stop there. As a matter of fact, Jesus even talks about the pure heart in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, and at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount in the section that we refer to as the Beatitudes, when he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So clean hands, pure hearts, but the list goes on. He says that you can have not lifted up your soul to an idol, or basically you can never have worshipped falsely. You could have never elevated something above God in your priority list. You could have never given yourself or given your focus or your attention or your priority to something else other than God. He has always been the priority. That's what that means. Uh, St. Augustine, the uh, fourth century bishop, says that our primary pro problem isn't that we believe wrong things or even that we do wrong things. He says that our primary problem is that the wrong things that we do and the wrong things that we think are a result of us loving the wrong things. He says the primary problem that you and I have is disordered loves or love that's focused on the wrong things. You don't just love enough or you don't, you don't, you don't love too little, you don't love too much. The fact is, is that we love the wrong things. So clean hands pure hearts, rightly ordered uh, loves through, through true worship, no idols. And then he says, you can have never sworn deceitfully. This one's really simple as well, that you could have never lied, that you've been always 100% honest, truthful in your conversations, in your actions, in your motives, in your heart. You cannot have any deceit. Now, take a moment, reflect on your life. How many of you fit that bill? and checked every one of the boxes off. I didn't hear anything, so I'm going to say good, because if, you're, if you've eliminated yourself, then you agree with the Bible when it says in Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, that there is not one who does good. No, not even one. 
So let's look at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. This is the response portion. This is us realizing that God is God, that we're not, that he's the creator, uh, that we're meant for his presence, but we've been separated from it. And now this is the response of our understanding that only God can ascend the hill of God. Only he is the one that's worthy of it. Because we look at this and go, okay, we have completely and totally been disqualified for this. We don't have clean hands. We don't have pure hearts. We've worshiped falsely, and not a one of us is completely honest. So we're disqualified from this. So he gives us this, this image of this gate flinging through. And now my, my, my geekdom, my inner nerd is going to show just a little bit here because when I read this and when I think about this, I think of the greatest movie trilogy of all time, and that's the Lord of the Rings movies. And the second of the Lord of the Rings movie called The Two Towers, there is a battle scene that's the climactic portion of the movie, and it's called the Battle of Helm's Deep. In this battle, the battle's not going great for the good guys, okay? The bad guys, the bad army, the evil forces are coming against them. They're beginning to overtake them. And we've seen that the king and his closest advisors, advisors and his closest servants are, are in this great hall, kind of in this chamber, and they're, they're blocked off. And he's, the king is, is being uh, adorned in all of his best armor, and, and everyone else is all armored up around him. And they're having this discussion of making this last great ride, this great, honorable, valiant ride out, even in defeat. If we're going down, we're going down on our terms, and we're going out with honor and glory. So they're having this moment of where they're trying to rally themselves where no hope is present at all but then we see all of a sudden these doors swing wide open and Aragorn the character walks in and he's been gone and he brings this hope and all of a sudden you just see the light just flood the room and and then they decide to take this right that they're they may be riding out to to in you know just uncalculable odds but they have hope now and I think that if we need anything in this time if we need anything right now we need to understand that these doors are swinging wide for the king of glory that these doors have swung completely and totally open and that there is hope in the midst of a dark situation a dark time and a dark world in which we live in and that hope those gates that are flinging wide not just cracking open but are flinging wide and the person the hope that's stepping through those doors is jesus christ and now I ask you to kind of take a little bit of an imaginary journey at the beginning of seeing what it looked like as the Ark of the Covenant was ascending the hill of the Lord and that there was this, this great crowd and there was this massive celebration, there was music and there was rejoicing and there was dancing. I'm going to ask you to take just another journey with me as we look into this person of Jesus. You see, none of us qualified for the clean hands, pure heart, right worship, and truly honest. None of us qualified for that. So just as God's presence came in the form of the ark back into the nation and ascended the hill to where only God can set, so did Jesus Christ, God in man form, come to this earth. Someone who was purely clean, who had clean hands, who had a pure heart, who always worshipped rightly, who always was honest and truthful. There was no deceit in him. The man who was flawless, the man who was sinless, the person, God in human form, that came and qualified all of us through his blood. That's the hope. That's the doors that swinging wide open. And what I want you to picture is yet another parade of sorts going up a hill people lined up on the sides of this path but this time instead of an ark of the covenant it's a man dragging a cross this time instead of shouts of acclamation and joy it was shouts of hate and anger and rage instead of dancing instead of rejoicing there was a mentality of justice being served for the only just man who is seeing an injustice and experiencing that. Think about Jesus Christ yet again 
ascending the hill of the Lord, ascending onto the hill of Golgotha. And instead of being encamped in a tent, in a center room, this time he was hung on a cross. He was hung on a cross, an innocent man, but he died an innocent death so that the guilty, my friends, you and I, could have this hope of being in the presence of God. Remember, God's creator. We were created to be in his presence, but we were separated. And that third thing I ask you to remember is that only God can make the way. Only God can bridge that separation. Only he can provide that conduit to where we can be in the presence of God again. Jesus' final statement on the cross, it is finished. At that point, it said that the earth quaked and the veil of the temple rent. It was torn violently in two, which removed the separation between the presence of God and us. And that's what we live in today. That is where we find ourselves. Who is this King of glory? This King of glory is Jesus Christ. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you that you are this King of glory. Thank you that you are our creator, your provider, your sustainer, you're the preserver of everything, God. God, thank you that you are making a way to redeem us, that you've made a way to bridge this chasm, to bring us back into your presence, God. God, and that you did that through coming in human form, living a sinless life, and, and still alive today. Father, thank you that your scripture points us to who is this King of glory. This King of glory is named Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.